be advised that this recorded webinar has been edited from its original format, which may have included a product demo. To set up a live demo or to request more information, please complete the form to the right. Or if you are currently not on CSC Global, there is a link to the website in the description of this video. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to today's uh, seminar, our uh, webinar, uh, where we're going to talk about navigating uh, through Singapore's evolving regulatory and business in landscape. Uh, my name is Sae Kwon Yu, and I'm a business developer, uh, business development director at CCCGFM here in Singapore, and I will be your moderator. So joining us today are Jovi Gunn from Lyman Private Limited and Agnes Chen from CCCGFM. Allow me to introduce them both. Uh, starting off with Jovi, as director of the management team. He has more than 15 years of experience in the industry across various jurisdictions, uh, including Singapore, New York, and Melbourne. His experience um, um, includes uh, providing directorships, regulatory compliance, fund operations and insurance services to varied clientele of fund managers, hedge funds, private equity, and private debt funds. Jovi is a chartered accountant of Australia and New Zealand and a registered director with the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority. Next is Agnes. Agnes is our managing director of CSC Global Financial Markets in Asia Pacific. She's responsible for our offices in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Singapore. She has more than 15 years of experience uh, in the operational and executive management, in the banking, trust, and wealth, manage, uh, wealth management, planning, structuring, compliance, and fund administrative uh, services sector. Throughout her career, she has held uh, many key roles representing licensed trust companies for corporate and fund services, as well as private and corporate trust companies in Singapore, Hong Kong, and other key jurisdictions. Agnes earned her bachelor degree in finance, and she's also a qualified trust and estate practitioner under the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners, also known as STEPT, and is a qualified practitioner in international compliance and anti-money laundering under the civil law training. And with that, let's welcome Jovi and Agnes. Today, we'll be speaking uh, about the following topics. Um, it's about uh, discussing the most recent guidelines that the Monetary Authority of Singapore, otherwise known as MES, has released across the following uh, topics. It's the guidelines to notice VCC N01 regarding the prevention of money laundering and countering of the financing of terrorism. Second, um, we're going to about accredited investor, documentation for fund administrators and compliance practitioners, at the technology risk management guidelines to combat heightened, uh, heightened cyber risks, and lastly, managing the risk of remote working in financial institutions. So this webinar is uh, it will be kind of like a discussion that uh, uh, I'll be having as moderator with Agnes and Jovi about uh, the topics that are highlighted on uh, the, uh, the topic screen earlier. Okay, here we go. So AML continues and will continue to be a core regulatory focus of authorities. And given the guidelines on prevention of money laundering and countering the financing uh, of terrorism for VCCs was introduced back in December 2020, how different are these requirements for the VCC to that of asset managers um, regarding the VCC notice 01? Maybe Jovi, would you like to take this away? Sure. Thank you, Kwanya. So, as many of you are aware, right, the guidelines to the VCC notice N01 was released in December 2020. And in short, this is largely similar to the requirements that is being imposed or expected from MAS with regards to other regulated financial institutions. So in the next few slides, I'm going to quickly bring you through some of the key requirements and what to look out for um, when it comes to complying with the same notice and guidelines. Okay, 
firstly, the Board of VCC retains the ultimate responsibility for complying with the AML CFT obligations under the notice. So it is imperative for the board to understand the MLTF risk involved and also to have an appreciation on how the control frameworks operate to mitigate those risks. To do this, the board will need to ensure that it has ready access to timely information on a variety, a variety of things, including the overall level of MLTF risk that the VCC is exposed to, the operating effectiveness of the current AML CFD controls, and any updates to relevant legal and regulatory developments that may have an impact to its operations. A VCC is required to appoint a eligible financial institution to assist with its performance of the relevant checks and measure under the guidelines and notice. So when you're appointing an EFI, these are some of the key items to look out for. Firstly, there must be a proper formal documentation in place detailing the scope of responsibilities the key personnel involved in undertaking the work and other relevant information. Secondly, the AML policies and procedures must be established at the PCC level. It must be updated periodically and has to be approved by the board. In the event that the EFI appointed is that of the fund manager, it is important to take note to have proper segregation of duties when it comes to dealing with the BCC customers, performing the necessary checks and measures, and also undertaking the internal audit process. Also, a VCC may rely on the party on the AML work that's been performed by the uh, by the third party for one of its customers. So when it is relying on the work, when the EFI is relying on the work performed by the third party, it needs to ensure that this third party is either an existing EFI or it is a financial institution that is regulated by a foreign authority with similar AML requirements as that of FedEx. And of course, the VCC board remains ultimately responsible for its AML obligations and oversight of the EFI. And lastly, the VCC needs to assert, ascertain that the EFI has the appropriate depth of expertise and proper procedures and processes in place to undertake the work. To understand the overall MLT of risk at the VCC level, it is a requirement to perform a holistic risk assessment and the broad MLT of risk factors to consider are the VCC customers, its products and services and delivery channels, and the countries and jurisdiction that it is operating in or its customer are domiciled. Lastly, it is also important to incorporate the results of the Singapore NRA report into this risk assessment. When we are undertaking the customer due diligence process, one of the key aspects is to identify the customer. The notice set up the minimum level of information required, such as the full name, unique identification number, residential or registered address, date or place of birth, uh, date and place of incorporation. So the, the information the slides here are some of the more commonly, I would say, obtained information to, to satisfy the minimum. Uh, and as a general rule, the best document to verify the identity is often one that is the hardest to obtain illicitly or to counterfeit. If there is any change to the beneficial owner or directors of the BCC, ACRA must be updated within 14 days. 
and the register of the VCC, the relevant register, is either kept at the office of the VCC, the fund manager of the EFI, has to be updated no later than two business days after the information has been provided. So it is important for the VCC to consider implementing measures such as that of, say, reminders or periodic review to the relevant stakeholders to ensure that such changes are captured in a timely manner. Ongoing monitoring of customer is a fundamental aspect of the overall AML risk management process. It is to be conducted for all business relations, but the extent and depth of monitoring will differ depending on the risk level assigned to the individual customer. From a transaction monitoring perspective, it is also important to take note of uh, various criteria, such as the nature of the transaction, the amount involved, whether these transactions are made you know, with the intention to avoid the threshold, uh, the origin and destination of the transaction, and of course, the parties involved. Okay, as mentioned earlier, EFI may rely on a third party to perform the CDD for one of the BCC customer. So in a typical third party reliance model, the third party often has a direct relationship with the customer and it will perform the CDD work in accordance with its own policies and procedures. This differs from the arrangement between the EFI and the VCC, whereby the work is performed in accordance with the VCC policies and procedures. So when there's such a reliance in place, it is important to take note of the potential gaps and to actively manage this gap. Uh, and also importantly, the EFI must not rely on a third party to carry out ongoing monitoring. Upon establishing the business relationship with a customer, but the verification of the customer identity has yet to be completed. If this delay is 30 days or more, you will need to suspend business relation with the customer and refrain from carrying on further transaction. If this timeline is 120 days or more, you will need to terminate business relations with the customer. So it is important to incorporate these limitations into the BCC policy and procedures and its monitoring mechanisms. From a training front, you know, all relevant employees and officers are to be trained as soon as possible from the point of their onboarding. Uh, refresher training is to be conducted at least once every two years or more regularly as appropriate. The effectiveness of such training can be, uh, I would say, measured through the use of tests after the training or looking at the quality and quantity of the deliverables, you know, as an as a example. It is also important to take note that this training record must be maintained for audit purposes. Well, thanks, Jovi. That's a very comprehensive answer to uh, the different requirements between, uh, you know, with regards to this uh, VCC Notice 01. Um, I'm also very curious to, to hear from you, Agnes. Uh, what do you see from, from you know, from, from a service provider's side uh, with regards to this question? Yeah, so thank you, Konyo and Jovi. Um, very interesting um, information update, and I think very comprehensive as well. So we spoke about a few things about um, from the BCC Notice 01 uh, that the board and senior management involvement is key to um, establishing this risk policies and procedures. Um, it's quite interesting because uh, in a traditional fund setting, uh, especially if we're looking at a Cayman or a Singapore, uh, traditional fund setting, you would have noticed that a lot of that procedures is actually uh, on the fund manager. So basically the risk and policies, the risk assessments and all is actually based on the policies of the fund manager. The VCC Notice 01 uh, works in a very uh, uh, refreshing way uh, and also very unique way. It deems that the VCC is an entity uh, altogether uh, as a regulated entity. So basically um, what it says is that aside from your fund management um, 
aspects where you need to um, ensure that you have policies, you need to now also maintain your policies under the VCC itself and be adhered to the board and also the senior advisory or the senior management, which is rather unique. And I think this is um, something quite refreshing, especially in the Singapore front where VCC has now been kind of uh, the, the new and emerging structure. Uh, it's something very um, key for our audiences to learn and also the, the fund managers to learn that uh, this needs to be kind of implemented. Um, so a lot of which we, we, we see fund managers relying uh, or kind of basing it on their fund management policies, uh, uh, their risk management policies on the fund management level. But now they need to know that they need to also place this on the VCC policy. So I think that sets quite unique in a way. Um, I also like to also mention about the eligible financial institution here because um, a lot of clients actually ask us, uh, can you be, as a fund administrator, can you then be the um, eligible financial institution. Um, I, I sadly have to say, uh, no, we cannot, because firstly, uh, under the Singapore um, Fund Administration regime, uh, or rather, if there is a, a regime uh, in the future, we will be regulated. But for now, most of the administrators that you see uh, are either having an RFA, which is a registered filing agent license, that is a company secretary license, or they have no licenses at all. So hence, um, we don't qualify for the EFI. In this case, the eligible financial institutions, a lot of our clients uh, or kind of uh, advice is really uh, the EFI in this case makes sense to be the fund management company, which is the financial institution. Um, I'll leave Jovi more to speak about that, but uh, this is basically what we've seen in the market uh, on the EFI, because most of the time, like what Jody, Jovi has mentioned, a lot of the touch points is with the EMI, EFI, with the uh, BCC board of directors and the investors itself. Uh, what actually happens is that the EFI, however, could base um, some of the uh, um, support with the fund administrators, especially, for example, investor onboardings, etc. But again, her um, Jovi has mentioned to ascertain that they are the ones monitoring the board of directors of the BCC signing off and also not uh, relying on third party on monitoring itself. So it's a check and balance in terms of everybody uh, doing their part in terms of the AML counter me uh, money laundering uh, measures per se, where the fund administrators do our part in actually screening the investors and also ongoing ongoing monitoring. The fund managers, on the other hand, and the board, BCC board of directors would have to be putting in place their risk man, risk policies and measures as well. So yeah, over to you, Jovi. Do you have any um, probably uh, more in-depth information to share about that? Thanks, Agnes. Um, what you mentioned is uh, is pretty much in line with uh, what I have in mind, and uh, especially in terms. I mean, importantly to take note is that this appointment of the EFI, more often than not, it will go back to the fund manager, because the existing AML obligations for establishing business relationship with the same set of customer is already being placed on the manager as part of the licensing condition. So this is what uh, I would have expect uh, from most VCC participants as well. Well, thanks both. It sounds uh, like, uh, you know, it's important. To, uh, thanks, first of all, Agnes, for, for clarifying the different roles, uh, you know, uh, especially of uh, being eligible as an EFI as a service provider. And I think with that, it has been clarified to the audience what they would need to do if they have not done so. And if so, of course, we're here, both Lyman and CSC are here to help. Um, what do you think? Let's move on to, to uh, the, a second, uh, our second topic that we'd like to discuss. Well, maybe on a separate note, an important aspect in relation to onboarding is that of the accreditor, accredited investor assessments. And one area of focus is with regards to the types of documentation that is accepted uh, as proof. What can you share with us, uh, Jovi and Agnes? What are the, uh, some of the common pitfalls that you would like to advise the audience on? Maybe Jovi, can you start off with this one? Sure, thanks, Wanya. Uh, before we proceed, I would just do a quick 
reminder on uh, to everyone on the definition of an accredited investor. So for AI who is an individual, it would mean that your net personal asset must exceed either uh, 2 million or your financial asset must exceed the value of 1 million or your income right in the preceding 12 months is not less than 300,000. For AI, there is a corporate, your net asset must be at least $6, 10 million in value or you are a trustee or such other person that the authority may prescribe. So from the documentation perspective, I mean, in the, in, the, in the universe of documentation to provide, to justify you as an AI, the, the, the more common ones you know, as, uh, for an individual, for example, would be your pay slip, your income tax statement, uh, which will also apply for corporate, uh, and for example, your the value of your pro property and the title deeds. So, you know, what I'm saying here is that the, the, there, there may be a standard, I would say, list among different service provider, be banks or what's not, that you know, is common. But it doesn't mean that we can't accept other reliable forms of, uh, of documents uh, to justify that. You know, I have an interesting example here to share is that, you know, we come, I come across a case whereby the uh, accredited investor status of an individual is basically uh, the value largely is because of inheritance through a piece of land, predominantly through a piece of land that was granted by the royal family. So in this instance, uh, we have to look at the title deeds and we have to look at other documentation involved to ascertain that this was actually indeed given by the royal family to the individual and, in, and indeed it checks out. So um, Agnes, do you have anything else, uh, examples in terms of uh, documentation that you would like to share from a fundamental perspective? Mm -hmm. Indeed, thank you, Joby. Um, so this is our typical favorite topic from fund managers, especially when they are onboarding their investors and doing the closings or subscriptions. So many times the clients would call us and uh, or rather call myself and okay, what do you think we should collect, etc. And and what do you think if if we have issues with uh, not issues, but rather sometimes because of this uh, day and age where we are un in the pandemic zone. Um, Sometimes it's, it's also difficult to, to ascertain a few documentation, for example, if they need uh, documents from the regulators, etc. It's a lot longer than before to collect documents. So a lot of which uh, that question points back to um, the fund manager in terms of how your risk assessments and how your kind of operational policies are. And I think um, Joby will be very familiar in drafting that for uh, most um, um, clients of yours is how do you as a fund management company also have policies in ascertaining your AI investors itself? Um, so there are very kind of uh, tailor-made rules and also checklists where they kind of ascertain the AI investors. Uh, so there may be in this case then very standard documents that they collect. So um, there are also fund managers that are very uh, fluid in this case, where they, they, they adhere with the changing times, but they keep in compliance with what MAS requires under the definition of the AI investor. So this is where it kind of sometimes uh, work together. We, we as fund administrators, of course, uh, do not dictate what you collect as a AI to, to determine AI investors, because uh, a lot of that as a team, uh, our assessment itself is actually done at the fund management level where you have your internal policies. So for us, it's really helping, especially if we are investor relationship uh, liaison with the investors itself, then we work with the fund manager to collect that. Um, some fund managers actually, they have closer relationships with their, with their uh, investors. They, on the other hand, would actually prefer to keep uh, the liaison with them themselves and also uh, we are supporting them as fund administrators itself. So it will be quite interesting, Jovi. Do you see any um, kind of uh, unique uh, risk policy assessments or kind of uh, checklist that has been rolled out by uh, fund managers? 
Thanks, Agnes. In terms of the checklist brought up by fund managers, is actually what I've seen is actually quite, I would say, standard in a way, like whereby you know you ask for the usual suspect, you know, in terms of salary, pay slip, right, and what's not. I think one important, I mean, a few points to 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 note here is that you know, if someone were to make a declaration that they have financial assets of say ten million, but it doesn't mean that. They, we have to go and ascertain that they have an entire 10 million. We just need to make sure that they meet the minimum, right? Ascertain to the minimum, and that will suffice. And secondly, from a net personal asset perspective, right? Because remember, it's always easier to, I would say, ascertain the asset side of things. But from a liability side of things, how are we going to address that? So I, was, I wouldn't say there's a hard and fast rule. It really depends on uh, the, the, the individual involved and their circumstances. But this, in, from what I see, this liability part to determine the net um, is always uh, an area, uh, I would say, of, uh, of uh, debate, per se. Yeah, certainly. Uh, we see the same thing as well. Uh, so most times, we, we it's not part of our kind of uh, scope as a fund administrator to ascertain whether the investor is an AI, but most of the time we, we assist in a way uh, because of the close relationship we have with our fund managers, uh, how to support them in terms of and, and the documents to, to, to collect. So uh, that's where we, we typically work with uh, advisors like yourself, where uh, you're supporting the client in, in um, advising their, their operational risk framework, et cetera, and we work together with them. That's, that's uh, exactly what we see as well. That sounds good, both. I mean, it sounds like that this, this is an, a very fluid process in the sense that it's not static and would always need to be reviewed in a timely manner to ensure that the documentation is, uh, yeah, how to say, up to date. Um, well, thanks for that. Um, let's move on. I see that a question has come in, but uh, I just would like to address to the audience. I would like to address to the audience that uh, the questions uh, Q&A session will be at the end of this this webinar. Um, so that's uh, all in all, we'll address your questions. So thank you for that. Given the, the growing use uh, of cloud technologies and application programming interfaces or APIs, MES has since revised its technology risk management guidelines in January, as everyone knows, uh, of this year to emphasize the importance of incorporating sound security controls for financial institutions. So what are the, some of the key changes involved? Because this is not the first time that they have done this. This is kind of like an updated uh, release of guidelines, right? So, uh, Jovi? Thanks, Kuan Yao. Okay, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to quickly take uh, through everyone on what are the key takeaways on this very recent uh, early release TRM guidelines. So, I mean, the first key change involved basically personnel, most notably the board and senior management. So now there is a requirement right, for the board to compose of, to comprise of members who have knowledge and expertise when it comes to managing cyber and technology risk. This differs from the previous guideline where it only requires the board to be involved in key IT decisions. Also, there's now a requirement to appoint a CTO or equivalent to manage uh, such risk. And the original list of responsibilities for the board on senior management has also been expanded. You know, uh, so the expansion has a focus on the oversight of the FI technology strategy, operations, and risk. The next key change is that of uh, due diligence and assessment. So now there is FI are expected to establish standards and procedures for vendor assessment. Uh, or, or should I say vendor evaluation prior to engaging them and, and some of the key criteria in, involved in the assessment include you know, detailed analysis of the vendor capability to develop the software involved and its security and quality assurance practices. 
FI are also expected to implement a vetting process for assessing the party who wishes to connect to the FI through the use of application programming interface, in short API. So some of the key aspects of the vetting criteria are the nature of the third party business, the industry reputation, track record, and most importantly, is cybersecurity readiness. Moving on, FI are also expected to conduct periodic access review of user rights to ensure that or to identify uh, rights that have been given to, say, redundant users, dormant users, or even inappropriate users. Privilege access to system are now only granted on a need-to basis, and the activities are to be locked, monitored, and reviewed regularly. There's also a requirement now to use strong authentication access control, such as that of the multi-factor authentication or token authentication for users who wishes to connect remotely. In the past, in the past guideline, there's only a requirement to use 2FA instead of MFA. And lastly, remote access to information asset at the FI level are only allowed from devices that are already secure to its internal security standards. Moving on to cyber resilience. This section, entire section here is somewhat new uh, in the guideline. It wasn't really mentioned in the previous set of guidelines. So what are the expectations here? So FI are expected to procure cyber intelligence monitoring services to keep itself updated on the threats involved and modify its risk assessment process accordingly. It should also implement a surveillance system to detect suspicious and malicious activities, conduct vulnerability assessment on systems, and penetration testing on its online services at least annually or more frequent in the event, say, there is a major update or change in the system. The FI is also expected to establish a cyber management response uh, plan and uh, to basically isolate and neutralize a cyber threat and secure, securely resume affected services. This includes establishing a process to investigate and identify the deficiencies and the respond procedures to address such deficiency. Do know that this plan is to be reviewed and tested annually. The guidelines also provide that FI should carry out regular cyber uh, exercises, scenario-based, to validate their response and recovery plan. Such exercises should include the business function, senior management, technical teams who are involved in cyber threat detection, and other relevant stakeholders. No, thanks, Jovi. So it sounds like uh, this last slide you talk about an exercise that will be part of the BCP, right? Uh, business continu continuity uh, process, uh, policy. Um, just out of curiosity, um, this is these are just guidelines. Are, do you expect any punitive measures coming out from MES uh, for, for you know, as as cyber risks are increasing uh, across the board, and especially since the pandemic, everybody's more you know forced from working from home. Uh, what do you think? Um... Yes, Guan Yang. So. This, even though there are deep guidelines, but this is in essence MAS expectation. So compliance with these guidelines is deemed, I would say, necessary in my view. Right. So uh, it is imperative that all FI adhere to this guideline uh, as close as possible. But of course, the, 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 the level of adherence and the, and, the, and the implementation procedures involved you know, has to commence with the size and nature of this business. Well, with that, um, it brings me to my next question. So what do you think? Does this have any impact to the current remote working arrangement as a result of the pandemic? Um, Jovi, would you mind commenting from a fund manager's point of view? Sure, Guan Yang. 
So yes, I believe it does have an impact uh, predominantly from two fronts. Firstly, security, right? Because from remote working, we are transitioning from a secure mm. corporate environment where there are appropriate safeguards, firewalls, etc., to a less secure, I wouldn't say unsecure, but it's a less secure home domain or public networks or mobile data networks environment. So security is something that that uh, that everyone needs to consider when implementing their remote working practices. You know, in the joint paper that was uh, issued by ABS and MAS on the remote working, which we'll be co covering shortly, uh, the you can participants can refer to section B on uh, operation. Uh, Sub section B, subsection 2, where there are useful insights on how to address this particular risk. And the next consideration, I would say the next impact, it would be, I would say, BCP resilience, right? Because before COVID or before remote working is the norm. You know, working from home for many is the BCP. So what is the BCP to this BCP now if remote working is the norm? So what is it, what is the organization like what I said BCP version two? What is your BCP version two? Maybe Akers, maybe you would like to take this uh, this rhetoric question of Jovi. <laughs> Yeah, certainly. Um, so, so in the past, um, we especially if you run a regulated entity like, for example, a trust company or a fund management company, uh, where you are expected to adhere to BCP requirements and drastic recovery requirements, etc. Um, in the past, BCP and DRs are very standard. So, what in what circumstances when your building gets into a fire, et cetera, and your documents are all burned, et cetera, what happens? Now the BCP, like what Joby has mentioned, is a, is, a, is a new normal where we are working from home. We are assessing the documents uh, remotely. We are actually using more technology uh, platforms, uh, whether you're using Microsoft Teams or a Zoom, et cetera, or a box to assess uh, documentation. So the, the nature of the BCP has changed a lot. And, and because of that, and also very in line with the cybersecurity risk um, that we have kind of just discussed, uh, it becomes very, very important that you are revising your BCP. So a lot of which um, for us, we, we, we change our, we kind of uh, adhere to or kind of uh, work on our BCP plans uh, drastically uh, over the period where we are using a lot of um, technology and also um, I would say world-class technology functions to to ensure that we are um, at, uh, we are inhabiting, for example, the multi-factor authentication, even on our lock-ins, for example. Uh, so interestingly, CSC runs a cyber risk uh, security unit as well uh, that provides to clients um, this cyber security support. So having said that, uh, we, we adhere to the world-class world um, kind of uh, equipment as well as uh, security manager, measures. But a lot of which uh, Jovi mentioned is also very relevant where what if you are an emerging manager that uh, may not actually have um, a lot of support in technology or in terms of the BCP measures, then a lot of which is also basing on the skill and also uh, basing on the advisory of your compliance uh, risk policies that you kind of adhere and change accordingly. So a lot of which um, a clients clients that always ask us, uh, what's your do you have you practice your BCP? That's a very standard. Uh, DDQ question, actually, uh, have you been practicing your, your BCP? And our response is always, since March last year, we have always been on BCP. And, and I think now the new normal is what happens if, uh, if you are basing on the normal BCP where you're working from home. And of course, uh, with the 75% uh, back workforce uh, encouraged back to, to, the, uh, to the workforce itself, um, maybe the uh, the 
I would say um, attendees are actually working more in the office now, but we we will actually have to also adhere to um, the remote working environment, etc. And I think this paper uh, of what ABS and MAS have actually turned out is really, really relevant because it addresses issues where we had to encounter in a short phrase and be able to get the economy and market going. But at the same time, I think in a long-term perspective, what's your next generation BCP? Or BCP 2.0, <laughs> so to say. So to say. Yes. Um, well, thanks uh, both of you for for for, uh, for your. Um, that brings us actually to 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 the last uh, question that I would like to discuss with the both of you, and um, has to do with with the following. In the risk management resilience. Uh, uh, that has been issued by MES and the ABS, or the Association, uh, Association of Banks in Singapore. What are the key takeaways? Can you take this away, please? Okay, thanks, Kwanya. So, um, the key, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to share with you what are the key takeaways. And firstly, a uh, quick one, what is, a, what is remote working? I mean, in short, it means basically working outside of your office and you're assessing your office application indirectly through the use of your home, public, you know, or mobile data network. An important point to note is that if you're working from your other offices, or a designated site set up for the BCP purposes. This does not constitute remote working. So what are the key areas of consideration for business management when it comes to remote uh, working? So uh, firstly, of course, because of the change in control environment whereby you're moving from your office to offsite, you know, you will need to review your working practices and arrangement to identify what are the risks involved as a result of this change and implement the necessary controls in place to mitigate this risk. Okay. The FI will also need to reassess and evaluate changes or potential changes to the vendor, uh, outsource vendor risk profile uh, with remote working and implement appropriate safeguards and contingency plan to ensure continuity of services. And from a BCP perspective, you, know, you will need to enhance your strategy to consider the large scale, I would say dispersion of your workforce over different locations. From an information governance perspective, one will need to consider the risk and implication of information loss when determining what service can be performed remotely. Controls will also need to be implemented to ensure that the devices, include personal devices of the staff who are working remotely are secure. Uh, FIR expected to continue to adopt sound and robust technology risk management practices to manage hardware and software deployed. You also need to keep yourself updated, keep yourself updated on uh, potential fraud issues as a result of this remote working arrangement. You should also consider implementing uh, a consequence management framework or incentive to encourage the right behavior from of staff who are currently working remotely. You will also need to enhance, you know. Uh, the monitoring activities of the transaction that is undertaken by all staff who are in high risk role. FI is also expected to consider legal and regulatory implication when setting up their risk, their remote working practices. And lastly, they should also pay attention to staff morale and welfare and provide resources for their emotional and mental support. Thanks, uh, Jovi. 
What about you, Agnes? Um, what is your point of view from uh, from the administrative point? Yeah, so certainly I think um, a few aspects here that we can see from uh, this, the, the slide is basically um, outsourcing, obviously very concerning, uh, as in it concerns the fund administrators quite a bit because uh, that's where your due diligence as a fund manager on your service providers is important. Uh, and a lot of which uh, under the MAS guidelines, you you would already have to screen your uh, outsourcing provider, which is your fund administrator as one of them. So this continues to be one of the key risk um, factor, uh, but it escalates in the case of uh, working from home um, environment where are your outsourcing agents or vendors um, adhering to, um, I would say, security measures, risk management actions, etc., to ensure that your data and your client's data is, is uh, secured, for example. So a lot of which, um, the, this also gives um, uh, a review in terms of what your outsourcing vendor is, is um, adhering on a day-to-day -day basis on an administrative level, for example, how are their teams working from home? Do they ha have their own laptops or is it a smaller team where they do not have uh, uh, an official laptop and some are logging in through home, for example? These are the few uh, key questions that typically um, it will be asked by managers as well because um, it's very critical if you're using your home laptop and your home laptop has a malware, for example, on it, and you're assessing client data, then is it a security risk? Um, so that also boils back to the cybersecurity risk um, guidelines as well as the risk management actions uh, of the um, remote working. Um, the other point where I felt that uh, has typically come up especially is uh, the verification of identity on a face-to-face -face level, especially for your investors uh, and us onboarding fund managers. So uh, in a way, um, if you're considering us, if you're a Singapore manager and most of our audiences here are, to, are Singapore managers, it's, it's rather easy for us to do a verification because uh, you have your Singapore NRC and et cetera, uh, verification is generally quite fuss free um, but a lot of which you would have realized that during the um, pandemic itself or during this season uh, this period a lot of verification verification is done through video conferencing especially if you notice bank account openings have also wrote that out for some banks where you have uh, your relationship managers dialing in uh, through a secure network and you verify your ID where you show them your IDs, et cetera, and this is you, uh, they ask you a few questions, et cetera. The um, remote working um, guidelines has also uh, recommended that these policies be also looked at, especially what you uh, controls you have in terms of making sure that uh, your uh, data verification, your identity identity verification is secured and is also in place. Do you have guidelines in terms of that? Are you going to do remediation in a case if uh, when you're allowed to actually meet, are you going to meet the person in, pers in, in person for verification? And I think these are the guidelines okay. where, uh, the, these are the controls where the guidelines would also determine uh, you as a fund manager rolling that out. Um, the same way as uh, we do, for example, when our uh, fund managers ask us, do you need the originals of the subscription agreement, for example? Uh, I think this is a typical question. Uh, although some of the documentation can be uh, received uh, in a digital copy, if you have your digital authorization and authentication policies actually set in, uh, we would also recommend in this day and age to also follow up with originals uh, because uh, there is a risk of fraud uh, in terms of the controls, uh, you don't know who is signing, etc. And and all this are actually in wraps with your 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 kind of uh, risk and controls over remote working guideline. Of course, um, we work with the fund managers to uh, to to also uh, follow their kind of guidelines. At the same time, we would recommend ours as well. Uh, in the case of any identity fraud or any uh, risk management issues, etc., we typically would want um, clients to also be protected and also consider that they have put in the controls. So this is where uh, I felt that it's also very interesting in, in this case, uh, especially when you're working remotely, 
um, I think the, the rest would be uh, generally very standard where uh, how do you verify your authorized signatory, whether payments uh, authorization is uh, verified, etc. Those would be part and parcel of uh, the fund administrator's uh, checklist and also procedures. But I think uh, very, very much in a remote, wo re uh, remote working environment, a lot of which is uh, for us as an administrator is verification of the face-to-face -face, um, uh, of our fund managers and our fund managers as for their investors itself. So I think that's that's generally the, the few points that I see uh, um, popping up these days. And um, I'm not sure, Jovi, if you have anything to add. Yes, uh, from a verification perspective, you know, the, it is now becoming, I would say, more common uh, for verification of ID to the use of online, I would say, applications, such as that of uh, Zoom. You know, uh, even then, this is accepted even um, locally. Um, I shouldn't say even, but it's accepted locally by some of the, even some of our, I mean, our banks. And um, so I think this remote working uh, norm now is bringing about a, a, a paradigm shift in the way we have been undertaking the work, not just from a due diligence perspective, but you know the way we conduct business as a whole. 